Once your book has been published, you may think that's the end of your job, but your job has just begun. You've got to go out, you've got to sell your book, and you've got to sell it with a smile. The notion of promotion and publicity is like orchestrating a dance. It's a great piece of choreography. Remember, the key to getting more radio and TV publicity than you ever thought possible is persistence. Keep your name constantly out in front of the media. Believe in your book or product, and don't give up. When I decide to have an um, an author and what I'm looking for is someone who can relate to the audience. Um, someone who feels very passionate about the book that they've written. Knowing the producers, knowing what subject matter works on what shows is, is, is your key. People want information. Tips, tips, tips. Give them something that they can take away with them. I can't tell you how exciting it is to open up a package with a book and a letter and the author understands what I need as a talk show producer. There are guests, there are ideas, there are formats, it's all there in front of me and I look at this and I go, this is going to be a great talk show. I can do this instantly. A good show for the audience is a show in which you have an interesting guest, uh, a guest with a certain amount of passion about whatever it is that they're talking about. Uh, even a guest uh, with a chip on his or her shoulder isn't always bad. I think that that's very important that an author should be able to, you know, tell good anecdotes, you know, bring a story to life. I'm not interested in statistics. I'm not interested in knowing how intellectual you are. You don't have to be a complete pro at it. What you simply really need to do is to be familiar with your subject, understand what is trying to be accomplished, and follow your instinct. They've invited you because you have some expertise that they want to share with their audience. Always know that. You're as much talent as the person who's interviewing you. Remember this, you never get a second chance to create a first impression. You're always on. My name is Brian Judd, and I'd like to welcome you to the video program, You're On The Air. It's a videotape to help you perform more successfully on television and radio shows. Helping me talk about these hints are Susie Reynolds, the producer and television uh, media trainer, and Rick Frischman, the president of Planned Television Arts. Brian, I'm really glad that uh, you're making this tape. We've worked with thousands and thousands of authors over the years, and they think that the important part is just writing a book. Well, that's just the beginning. The important part is what do you do when you get on TV, and you get on radio, and, w and when you're talking to newspaper people. And that's what we're going to talk about in the tape today. I agree with you, Rick. Getting your book together is really just the beginning. Without an image, and everyone needs to have an image, without the proper image and presenting it effectively on television, you really can't do yourself justice. You can't sell your product. So we really want to talk here about how we can prepare everyone in the best possible way to develop an image, know what it is, and present it effectively. Well, I agree. It's critical to, to project an image and to have that image in mind because I started writing my book seven, eight years ago, and I had three books out. I had my own cable access t television show, and I had been on many TV and radio shows. But when I first started media training, I didn't realize how much I didn't know. So it's very important to, to have that image, to project the image, but before you project it, you have to, to train and, and practice presenting that image. It's critical. I always tell uh, my, my clients that preparation is a subjective thing and everyone has a different way of doing it but consulting a professional is always safe because as much as you can do by yourself you can't be objective it's impossible to get outside of yourself and be objective where you're concerned you're subjective at best so I think that the video camera is probably the greatest single tool as that I use for authors because when I turn the camera around and they tell me, you know, I've done this before. I'm prepared. I've done cable shows. I've done radio shows. I know what I'm doing. And I say, fine. Let's turn the camera around and let's see if you're happy with where you are at this point. And it's very interesting to see the results because very often, most often, they say to me, boy, I, I, I really didn't, didn't think I looked like that. And <laughs> to be able to see yourself as other people see you is the key. And it's not about you. It's about the image you're projecting. If it's not in sync with what you're thinking, feeling, and the tone of your book, and what it is you're trying to convey, you need to start over. That's exactly what happened to me. I, before I took the media training, I thought all I needed to do was just talk about what was in my book. Right. I didn't realize that you have to be able to project the words properly. You have to be able to, to, to use your, your gestures and body language to reinforce that. 
and it's not just the words, it's the total, the, the total image that you project that really carries your entire message to the audience. Most authors hate themselves when they are our first, uh, when they watch themselves on, on TV. Sure. Uh, I had the uh, unfortunate experience, or maybe good experience, where I got a call from uh, Oprah people saying, you're going to be on the show tomorrow. And what I do is train people all day long. Well, when you're going to be a guest on Oprah, I mean, this is Oprah, I was like this. I was shaking. And all night long, I was going over my message points because it's here that you have to get it down first. Not just the camera, but you have to understand exactly what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. And then you'll appear poised uh, on air. What are the questions that people should ask themselves before trying to launch a media campaign and what do they need to be prepared for that they probably don't know about? Let me congratulate you for buying this tape and watching it today. Uh, you've already catapulted yourself above most of the authors out there. Uh, we've handled hundreds of uh, authors this year and most people when they come to us don't know what they're doing. Uh, so you are already above and beyond most authors out there. First of all, if you're doing the, uh, the, the book yourself, you have to decide how many books you want to have out in the stores. And uh, you can't put out too much money. I mean, we have one person who uh, self-published and he printed 50,000 books. Well, that's a lot of books to keep in your garage, let me tell you. Uh, so you got to start with 5,000 or 10,000 and, and walk before you run. Um, so then you have to decide what kind of budget you have. The biggest problem authors have today is they're undercapitalized. It's just like a business. And uh, you could be a great writer, but what we're doing here is we're running a business and, and understand where our goal line is and how we have to get to the goal line. Uh, if you have a, uh, a publisher who's published your book, understand that uh, you must be in control. They're not going to do it for you. And, uh, you have to be loving and you got to be sweet and make them want to do things for you. But it's got to be a win-win situation. You're not going to do it just right. because you're a nice guy. For an author to pay attention to a, uh, a potential market like television from the very beginning I think is crucial because you've got to realize it's a little late when your book's already done and sitting there on the coffee table. Start early. We get calls often two years before pub date because uh, to do a campaign properly uh, you have to uh, go specifically after print very early. Magazines, uh, book reviewers, uh, uh, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus and Library Journal, they want galleys four, five, six months before pub date. Uh, then you want to do a review mailing uh, to all the top newspapers in the country. And understand the New York Times is probably not going to review your book. Uh, even if you're a random house, the New York Times is probably not going to review your book. But you have to get it to all the right editors uh, and make sure uh, that they've seen your book at least and give it a shot. So start early and plan. And a lot of it you can do yourself. Lists are out there. Um, to hire publicists just to do a mailing for you often isn't the right way to go. Uh, we want you to do as much as you can yourself and save the other dollars uh, to help us get you on TV, radio, and newspaper interviews uh, across America. I think the kind of uh, preparation that's necessary uh, for, for launching some sort of a search like this is, is first starts with the kind of outlets you're looking to get on. And I always tell my authors two things. The first thing you should do is reread your own book. Read it as if you're reading it for the first time and as if you're reading it as an audience member or someone else who, who's out there is going to buy your book and look at it from a distance. What are you getting out of it? Is there several, two or three points that are jumping off the page that you are really saying, wow, I really came away learning these three things. I didn't realize I put them in quite that way, but they're really hitting me. There are lots of ways that you should uh, choose a publicist. First of all, you should interview them. Uh, do some, uh, some due diligence. Meaning when we get calls from, uh, from authors and from publishers, usually they've heard about us from at least three other sources. So ask a lot of questions, find out what campaigns that publicist has worked on, um, get some references for sure, and see how are they paid. Uh, publicists are paid in lots of different ways. Some ask for retainers every month, um, anywhere from 1000 to 5000 a month uh, with a six month uh, uh, guarantee where you have to pay them for six months. Other ones work on a project by project basis. You have to see what's comfortable for you, what fits into your budget, 
Uh, and lastly, you got to go with your gut. And literally, you got it, it's an important thing. Um, see how you feel after talking to the publicist. It's important to just feel supported. If you have the sense that someone is really in your court and really supportive of you, it's important, of course, that they know their stuff. But that is a very, very big point that I think can't be overstated. You have to feel like you have their, that they have your best interest at heart and they're really on your side. What we throw back into the ocean, as you say, about 70% of the people that come to us because they haven't done their homework, uh, they haven't made a plan, a business plan, and they don't know, again, what the goal line is. From the beginning, think television is a visual medium. What is going to happen in a television interview? How am I going to bring this to life in front of a television camera? That's uh, very important for an author to think of early on. No one is going to be a better publicist than you. We often can get in the door better than you. Uh, we can get the, uh, the producers at Good Morning America and Today's Show on the, on the phone. And yes, we can get the producers at Oprah on the phone because before they were at Oprah, we worked at, with them uh, in Minneapolis and uh, in Miami and all, in Detroit uh, before uh, when, when they were uh, small producers and local producers. Mm -hmm. Then they became uh, producers at Oprah. So yes, we have access, but that's no guarantee. And anyone that tells you that they guarantee that they can get you on the Today Show or Oprah or Jay Leno is, uh, is lying to you. That's one thing I found particularly with, with my book when I first started on the, the, the tour is that I thought everybody wanted to know about what was in my book. And they want to know about my book. And they didn't care. The producers want to have a good show. They want to increase their ratings. But the key to that is the audience. And you have to look at your press kit, your book, your presentation, your preparation from the audience's viewpoint. They don't care about you. They don't care about your book. They don't care about the TV show. What they want to know is, what can I learn? How can this information make me better, make me succeed, make me happier? That's what they want to find out. So you have to present your information from that perspective. And it's critical to, to, uh, to approach the producers with, Here, I, here's information that I have that will be of interest to your audience, that will, that will make them want to tune in, make them want to come back next week, will make them watch the entire show. They should watch television. I mean, it takes a week, probably, to just look at every show. If you want to go on the Today Show, I hope you're watching the Today Show. If you want to go on Fox after breakfast, you better watch the show because it's very unpredictable. The demographics are very important. To, demographics of the audience particularly the people who will be reading your book for example I've written a series of job search books and I have to contact people on radio shows who are perhaps college students or older adults and I have to be able to use different examples for different audiences so it's critical to know the, the people to whom you're speaking and then getting on the right stations that reach these people and in the right context so it takes a lot of research a lot of uh, pr preparation that you have to do to find out who you're talking to, how you can take the information in your books and relate it directly to their needs. It's, it's a critical point. Let's use your book as an example, Brian. That's a very good idea. If you were to do this, well, when you did your book, and we, we did a lot of work with you yes. at that time, who is your audience? Let's define that demographic. I broke it down into several different groups. For example, I had college students who were about to graduate from college and starting their careers. I had an older segment who were perhaps laid off their job. They may have been on the job for 30 years and they were laid off. They had many different responsibilities, different ways to project themselves in the job search. And, had, and, and well, different people even trying to change careers. Oh, sure. A lot of different. In midstream. Blue collar uh, audiences. Of people, any yeah, so it's, it's uh, but you have to be able to, to define each audience and then find the radio station that would reach these people. For example, a, a country western station would have a different audience than would a news program in Manhattan. So you have to be able to use examples to the people who are listening to that particular station at that particular time. If you're speaking to someone on a morning drive time uh, radio show, you'd use more different examples than if you were on an hour afternoon talk show. So it's very important to know to whom you're speaking and then the examples you can use for that audience. My show is a daytime show we're on in the morning, so we are typically watched by women between the ages of 18 and 49. These are women at home, or it's mostly women at home, mothers, people who either work at night or around during the day. These are people who are looking for, how do I fall in love? How do I, how do I make my marriage better? How do I um, do it right? How do I make sure my kids are healthy? And what's the kind of, what's the best book to buy? What's the best toy to buy? They want information. That's what they want. Again, it goes back to image, wouldn't you say, when you're trying to really hone in on an image that you're trying to project that really hits the nerve of your listening public. You have to public. know the audience. And when planning a media tour, uh, you have to decide who's going to buy your book. 
Uh, when we worked with Maya Angelou, we went after urban contemporary stations, uh, which are sometimes the most powerful stations in America. Uh, when we do satellite TV tours or when we send an author on tour, if you do a midday TV show, who's going to be watching that day? Housewives at home. Uh, the morning drive tour is so effective. Why? Because you can reach people on their way to work who are enslaved in their cars. I mean, normally... And a broader they, demographic of, of uh, gender than you would normally reach in the daytime, I would sure, think. Sure, and, and you can pinpoint the exact kind of audience that you want. We can hit an Imus kind of audience, a Howard Stern kind of audience. You can hit women 25 to 49, or contemporary hit radio, which typically would reach uh, younger people 15 to 25. So you have to decide who your audience is and then talk right at them. Start watching TV now. We hate it when authors come to us and they say, gee, I'd like to be on Ricky Lake, or I would like to be on Phil Donahue, and they don't know that Phil Donahue is off the air. You know, or Sally Jesse Raphael, watch the shows. Watch Good Morning America, Today Show, CBS This Morning, every day. If you are um, coming on Fox after breakfast, you have to know it's a loose environment. It's very conversational. If you are going on another kind of show, um, just from watching, like the Today Show, it's very question and answer, and you have to just adapt yourself to the situation. See what authors they have on the air, and see how these authors perform. See what, it, what is it about that author that made you feel good that made you want to buy that book? What is it about that author that made you want to throw up? And, <laughs> and it's a terrible thing, but we've had producers in the past, unfortunately, say, I've wanted to throw your author literally off the air. I was one of those producers. So I was one of those producers. I was one fact, of those authors. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that's how I became a media trainer, because I was on a particular show and I was getting pitched on a weekly basis by publicists from publishing companies, sending me books by the truckload. We've got this great new author, and this is a subject I know you want to talk about on your show, and this author is great, and you gotta, you got to have him on the air. And I would call them up, and really frequently what happened as a producer, my goal is to make my show work. That's all every producer cares about, your segment, your show, understanding what your host is all about, and knowing that you're going to have a, a show that's a winner. If I can find an author that's going to reinforce that and give me the meat and the substance to talk about, terrific. But the issue is, not do they have it in a book and have they addressed the right topic, but can they speak to it? And frequently you have somebody that's been sitting at home for two years, <laughs> writing, writing you know, paragraph after paragraph, not understanding that 30 seconds of dead air time is giving the director a heart attack. Not only that, you said these people wrote this book two years ago, and now it, it's two years later, and what they wrote about then isn't relevant anymore. So what you have to do when you contact producers, let's say you're going to do it yourself, is, is find out what's in the news. I mean, read the newspaper. You've got to read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and USA Today every day, and then uh, tie in... Uh, with your book, what's going on in the news. Understand that producers are not going to read your book. And in fact, they're probably not even going to read your press kit. You're going to spend all this money and you're going to spend all this time writing a press release that probably they're not even going to read. They're going to read a one-page pitch letter. And here's a hint, use bullets. Because I used to be a producer at WOR Radio, and I got 50 press kits and books a day. And we have time to literally see about two paragraphs and a few bullets and say, is this going to be interesting for my audience or isn't it? And, and, and is this in the news? And lastly, understand that they don't really care about you or your book. What they care about is ratings because there are lots of radio stations out there, and now there are about 40 or 50 TV stations. Right. You know, that clicker is really fast. It used to be you got, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Now you have 40, 50 stations, and if you don't turn them on in about 10 seconds, you're gone, they're on to the next station. When I first came out with my books seven years ago, I thought I was totally trained, that I was able to go on and perform on television and radio. And another author called me and said, I've got someone that might help you do better on the air. And I thought, as a whim, I'll call and see if she can do something for me. And I was astounded to find out how much I didn't know. I highly recommend that you do some form of media training before you start this process, before you even contact a producer, before you even contact a show. 
contact a media professional, someone who can train you to perform properly on the air. It'll do wonders for your performance because when you get on, you can get on a show. If you don't perform properly, you don't sell one book. So I know not everyone is comfortable sitting down and talking to a microphone, but I think it's important for authors to get some kind of preparation training so that you're not reading your notes. I found that there are some people who come in and this is how the interview goes. They're looking down the whole time. They don't make any eye contact with me. Do you find that, that producers and talk show hosts as well actually prefer to have uh, uh, authors who've been media trained? Well, they know. They know if, uh, if an author hasn't been trained. In fact, uh, that's why we have a rule that every author must be trained before we let them out on the road or out on the air. And, and often they've been on tours before uh, and they've done this, but there are little tricks of the trade that we can teach them. Uh, and it can mean the difference between selling 5,000 books and 50,000 books. It can mean the difference between getting on Oprah and getting on AM Yakima. You know, <laughs> people know if you really care about them. And uh, yes, everyone has to be trained, and the producers know and the hosts know. As, as an author who went through this media training, I found the most important benefit of that was to have a little bit of, of confidence going in. If you know what to expect, if you know what, uh, what the camera set, setup will be, what the people will be doing, how to talk into a microphone, how to gesture, how to, how to relax. You find yourself, you feel a lot more confident. The biggest problem we have is people being scared. They're frightened of getting on TV. They're frightened that, that they're going to flub their lines, that they're going to freeze. And, and one of the biggest uh, uh, problems is what happens if I'm asked a question and I don't know the answer? What do you do when, when that happens? That How do you teach them? The number one question. <laughs> And the number one fear that people come to me with, uh, every author comes to me and I say, what's your greatest fear? And let's start there. And that's it. What if they ask me something and I'm humming, 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 and I don't know what to say and I don't know where to go or I'm nervous and I can't get it together. And here's the example that I give them. Uh, well, you're going to tell them now? I'm going to tell you right now. If you buy the right next now, tape, we'll tell you I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> There's the only way to not have to worry about that is to have your own agenda. The only way that fear is going to really be real is if you're relying on an interviewer to conduct your entire show and you're at the mercy of every question they ask you. So the only way around it is to have your own agenda, know what you're there for, know your information, and what you're there to do in your three minutes, your seven minutes, and turn it around to your agenda no matter what. If you have a central pitch that you believe is the best thing you've got to get across, uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with trying to communicate that. However, if the initial question from the host is three miles away, I wouldn't make some light year segue uh, into that. I would, uh, would try to work it in in a way that appears comfortable. And one of the ways of doing that is telling them a secret. Remember the show, I've Got a Secret? Is you gotta tell them that I have the secret that's going to change your life. And I have the secret that's going to change every interview that you do. And if you stay tuned later today, I'll tell you what that secret is. Well, I have <laughs> another example which people seem to really respond to, and that is the presidential press conference. People have, everybody's seen one of those. And you see the president get up there looking terrific. He's got his 15 minutes of free air time, and he's ready to make the best of it. He's got a sea of reporters at it, out there who have spent the last two weeks creating the question so they'll really look intelligent and make their paper look good when they stand up to ask the question. And he gives them all their due diligence. He waits very patiently while they ask their three-part, four-part question and then says, you know, that's a great question, but what I want the American people to know is, and there he goes right back to his agenda. And every politician does it, and every time the president get on, gets on, he does it, and talk show people do it. And that's, you've got to drive that, that point home and you can address cursorily that question, but then get right back to what you're there for. And learning how to do that is something that we really practice a great deal, that Brian practiced a great deal in media training, and I think 
<laughs> that's the key. Oh, that's it's very important because when you're going on the show, you're thinking about how you're coming across and you're not really thinking about what you're trying to say. But if you practice, if you do the preparation beforehand, and if you know those three or four or five points that you really have to get across, then you can do it more naturally on the air. That you're, even though you're, you may be nervous, but you're projecting yourself because these, it's, it's routine. You, you have memorized or you know what you're, what you're trying to say. I, think, I always think a good analogy is, ra is tape recording. Because when you tape record yourself, or even you hear yourself on your phone machine, people say, Does, is that me? Did I sound like that? It's very much the same with videotape. So when you're talking, and, you're, and, and in fact we are talking about radio as well as television here today, so it's all those technologies, videotaping yourself, audio taping yourself, and having a chance to listen to yourself and to look at yourself the same way that others will perceive you and look at you and draw the judgments that you think they will be drawing. And not about whether you have a bad you know, hair day or whether you've got some makeup out of place, but whether or not you're conveying your point does the whole picture come together? Are you reinforcing all the things you came to talk about? And are you taking control of your opportunity to be on the air and get your points across? One of the things I found to be most difficult was the timing because you have perhaps 30 seconds to answer your question where if you're talking to a friend, you can, you can take minutes to say what you're trying to say. But when you're on a news show, if you have three minutes on a national show, you may have 30 seconds to answer a question. So you have to be able to practice that. What I did was I took a video, an audio tape, I put it in my car, which I had uh, questions with 30 seconds of space between each question. And I would practice as I was driving, I would practice talking in 30 second uh, time frames. That was very helpful to me. To, to Once I got on the air, I had a sense of how long 30 seconds was. The length of an answer on a two-minute news segment should probably be about 15, 20 seconds at best. Just get to the heart of it. Answer the question at hand so now they can get another two or three questions in. If it takes you two minutes to answer one question, you don't look focused. Generally, uh, the host would uh, give you guidance if you're either speaking too long or too short. But as a general rule in most interview programs, I would think answers that run roughly in the 20 to 40 second range wouldn't be out of bounds. When people come prepared, when they really, really know how much time they have, how much a minute feels like, what does three minutes feel, feel like in an interview, how quickly does it go by, or seven minutes, how much information can I get out in that period of time, and you're prepared and you know you're, you're, you're there and you know your subject matter, the fear is completely diminished. You've got a lot of tools at your disposal. I also tell people to remember uh, stories, individuals that punctuate their experiences or the, the, the tips that they're there to give. Because if you've had that experience, chances are everybody else out there has as well. And you also have to remember to smile. Be yourself. Have a good time. Have a uh, good time. That's and, it. and enjoy yourself. And always remember to hook them. Now, a few minutes ago, I told you I was going to tell you a secret. I'll bet you, you've been wondering what the secret is. Well, I'll tell you what it is. Number one is you have to be in control, which means don't wait for them to ask you the right question. When you talked about the power of three, having three interview questions that you're going to get to in, in every interview, but you have to be in control. And then uh, the art of segue. You know, when, when Bill gets uh, asked a question, as you said before, and it's not the right question, you have to learn how to segue right back to where you want to go. So. You're in control, don't ask, uh, don't wait for them to ask the right question, and always understand how much time you have. You know, you got 90 seconds to get every answer out, and after that, you've lost them. Remember that this is your moment, this is your moment of fame, your, your opportunity, and you're the driver, you're behind the wheel, and you've got to steer the, steer the bus in the direction that you want it to go for the time that you're there. And really, the other thing is, I mean, whether it's Katie Couric or anybody else on television, the only thing they want is a great segment. If you're along, the reason they have 9,000 pre questions prepared is in case they've got somebody who really doesn't know, hasn't gotten more than a two-word answer, <laughs> doesn't know what to do, they've got to fill up their time. So if you're prepared and you have information and you have experiences and examples, they're going to let you go. Their segment's going great. They're thrilled. Some of the things we're going to teach you today is when you get on the air, you can't just tease. You're there. First of all, you've got to make them fall in love with you as an author. I mean, we had a, uh, uh, an old author on uh, years ago, his name is Bill Shakespeare. He was a great writer, but the guy was lousy on TV. 
And the first thing you got to do is make them love you. And secondly, is you can't give them too much. You got to make them want to buy your book. Remember why you're there. You got to get them to want to buy your book. But the flip side of it is you can't be an obnoxious author. Uh, and you got to give them a few tidbits every interview so that they say, yeah, you know, that author was really good and wanted to help me, and I learned something, so I better go to the bookstore and get that book. You might mention when you identify that person that he or she has written um, a particular book, but they're not on to promote their book, and so when they're being interviewed, they shouldn't talk about their, their book. They shouldn't be there selling their book. I think that is a, that's a turnoff. Don't be afraid to work with a video camera with your husband, your kids. Just get, keep the camera on yourself and go through all of the things that we've told you about here today. You can also use the mirror as a technique. And this kind of practicing really will prepare you even if you're able later to have a media training. There's lots you can do on your own. Be creative and use that as an opportunity. The other, the other most important thing I think I tell people is this is an opportunity to make all your mistakes in private where you don't have to, the other greatest fear of authors, of course, is getting on TV and making that big, big boner mistake that they're really afraid to make, no matter what, and it makes them look like a jerk, and they're upset, and, and that's it. That's the fear. That's that nightmare dream that they have. It rarely happens. But the reality is that if you do that at home in your own living room, and, you know, you get it out of your system, you don't have to go there. You feel like you've had a safe opportunity to make those mistakes, and you you can get on to the next thing. Well, these days, I understand most people have a videotape player and machine at home. Exactly. So you can very easily set it up and, uh, and do interviews yourself and then see yourself uh, in private um, and, and just keep on going over and over and over again. It's important for someone to train you and sit with you. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but it'll stay with you forever. And producers look for that. Okay, you have your book, you have distribution, you're ready to roll, you pick the PR firm, now what? Let's talk about a press kit, and let's talk about how do you get on the air. One of the key things that has to be sent to the station, whether it's radio or um, television, and we take care of that, is a press kit, a media kit, it really doesn't matter what you call it, it is a kit, it is a packet that contains biographical information about the person. Yes, that can be facts to them, but you want a kit to arrive. It may have photographs. It may have uh, samples of the product. Uh, it would certainly have uh, the book. It would have material that, in the hands of the person ahead of time, gives them a better understanding of really what it is that you're trying to get out. Uh, first of all, you got to have a press kit, and a uh, press kit we talk about later, but very briefly, you have to have uh, press release, bio, uh, suggested questions, newspaper stories. Now, I don't care if it's from 1960. That shows that you've been around and that you're in the news. Um, and in the press kit, we're talking about what's newsworthy today. We're going to give them hints and tips and things that are, that are appropriate uh, that people care about. I can't tell you how exciting it is to open up a package with a book and a letter and the author understands what I need as a talk show producer. There are guests, there are ideas, there are formats, it's all there in front of me and I look at this and I go, this is going to be a great talk show. I can do this instantly. But I'd like to address something else right now and that's the letter that's going to accompany your press kit. And Rick alluded before, bullet points. As a producer of radio, television, whatever it is, you've got time to read about two paragraphs. If you haven't grabbed a producer in the first two paragraphs, it's going on the floor and the likelihood is they're not going further to find out. They'll look through the th first two paragraphs, bullet points, why you're going to make a great show for them. And they'll also probably open your book and look at your chapter headings and see if there's three things that pop out very quickly at them about a, a compelling kind of uh, subject matter for the talk show. One thing I've found to be very helpful is that start off with a, the opening sentence should be, here's what I can do for your audience. And then send a show idea, an example of not just for your particular segment, but examples of how you can bring other guests on along with you and to create a half hour show or half hour segment just on your topic. But you're helping the producer create this entire segment. So they'll be more likely to have you on if you can do that for them. I think that's, that's a good way of, of, uh, of getting your face out there if you are willing to, to go on as an expert 
and, and not necessarily talk about your book per se, but um, get some recognition as an expert in a particular area. They thought there would be no radio interest in my book, so I decided that they were wrong and discovered a publication called the TV Radio Interview Report and placed an ad in that publication. So I wrote a very provocative ad that I thought would interest the producers. I had been a producer in television, so I knew the kind of thing that might catch their interest. Placed, I had that ad placed and then did interview after interview from home. Here's a copy of, of the trade publication that we publish. It's called Radio TV Interview Report. And in the last 10 years, it's become known really as the Bible of the industry among producers looking for authors and experts and spokespeople that are available for interviews. The reason the producers like it is that it's a lot quicker and easier to read than the stacks of mail that they get. Uh, they know that we've pre-screened the uh, people that are in here. We, we reach over 4,000 radio, TV producers, hosts, and program directors all across the country. Uh, typically, we find that uh, the, the type of response people can generally expect is that they run a half page three times. Uh, they generally can expect at least 15 calls from radio uh, radio producers all across the country interested in interviewing them via telephone. I think it's a, a very important thing to have realistic goals also because you can't automatically start out on Oprah. I wanted to. I, I, wanted, I came to Rick early in my career and said, <laughs> uh, get me on Oprah. But uh, had I gone on Oprah very early, I would have bombed. You have to start off in the smaller stations, in, in Boise, or Good Morning Dubuque, and, yeah. and, and work your way up and, and, and practice and make the mistakes on the, the local cable access shows. And then when you get on the, the larger shows and you're, you're, you're more capable to perform, you get your tape of the shows, you use that to sell yourself to the larger shows, and you work your way up. And it's something that you have to, to pay your dues, so to speak, but it's something that you really have to do to, to practice and get good. So when you perform on Oprah, you're, you're successful. I'd like to reinforce that idea of paying your dues, paying period, because I think that people don't understand what kind of an investment, as you said, Rick, they really do need to make in to themselves and their product because the best mousetrap, the best widget, the best anything with the greatest packaging is not going to jump off at the shelf to people. What sells products? Commercials, marketing, promotional campaigns. And that's where you come in. Well, let's also go back to Oprah. I mean, we've had uh, every author that, that ever comes to us now says, I want to be on Oprah. And I wouldn't mind getting the Wall Street Journal. And I'll take <laughs> a little bit of Good Morning America. And I think we have some quotes from Patty Nager, who's the book coordinator at uh, Good Morning America. In fact, I knew Patty when she was a director of publicity at Prentice Hall 15 years ago. And uh, it's not easy to get her on the phone. But the point is, Oprah is the top, and you have to do everything to get there. You, you, and even if you've been on Oprah, uh, um, that doesn't mean a book is going to be a bestseller. And uh, we've gotten four or five books on, on Oprah this year. Uh, I spoke to a director of publicity at Simon & Schuster, and they said that she booked 10 authors on Oprah. And out of those 10 authors that were on, only three became bestsellers. So it's not a guarantee. When you get on Oprah, it all depends on how the show is formatted, if you're on alone, if you're on for a panel, if she holds up your book and talks about it and says, this is the best book that has ever been published, you got to buy that book. So Oprah is not always going to make your book a bestseller. And uh, one of our, our long-term clients is someone you guys may have heard of, Mark Victor Hansen, who has sold 14 million books of Chicken Soup for the Soul, right. Chicken Soup for the, for the Women's Soul. And in fact, when you see this videotape, you'll probably notice that this week he has books number, uh, his books are number one, two, and three on the New York Times bestseller list. And let me tell you something, he's never been on Oprah. And the way they've done it is they interviewed every top selling author in America and he got tapes like this and books like this and said, authors out there, how did you become a bestseller? And what he found out from M. Scott Peck and lots of other famous authors are you have to do everything you can. You gotta do every radio show, you gotta do every little TV show, and then when an Oprah or a Tonight Show or a Today Show comes, that's just gravy, but uh, that's not what's gonna put you on the list. You have to have distribution set up too because you can be on Oprah or on any show and have people go to the stores and if your book is not there, 
you've lost all that uh, that media time. So the important thing is to set your distribution up, take the time to, to plan your campaign. Set distribution up, get the books in the stores, or just have an 800 number if you prefer to have people go through a fulfillment service. But have some way for the, the purchaser to buy your book before you even start out, otherwise it's all for naught. Well, I think going back to the investment, I'd like to take that back one more time because I think that what you do is so important. The packaging, you get the package. But even at that, coming when, when well-known authors come to you, I think they often still have the expectation that the publisher is going to do everything or you're going to do everything. And you can do a lot. You can get people on the best shows on television. But if they can't turn that moment and that opportunity into some sort of an engaging exchange with the audience and with the people out there so that they want to buy that book, it hasn't worked and, and they have not helped you to help themselves. That's, I think, they have to plan for having a publicist. That's a crucial in, middle person to have to have to get from where they are to where they want to go. Publicity, very, very important. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who come to you haven't even thought about it or putting any money aside for such a campaign. What try and encourage people to do is to do, make every effort to keep a video log of what they've got. You know, make a record of everything. Get somebody to videotape it so that if the national show producer or the, the next level producer wants to see any videotape, I mean, you've got something. One of the first things I'd like you to do is go to your local cable TV show. And, and generally, they will take a local author and do it. It could be a Channel 12, Long Island, or there's something called uh, and the exchange in... Uh, in Fairfield County in Connecticut and probably in your town there's always a cable station that will take a local author and get on that show and make sure you get a tape and then we take those tapes and we edit it together so that when we go to the bigger TV shows the affiliate stations across the country and then eventually to the Good Morning Americas and the Oprah's and the Sally Jesse's we have a tape of you on air in action being great and, uh, and that's what's going to turn the producer on. Frequently on my shows, the, the, the producer or the, the executive producer would say, do you have tape on this person? Understand that it's not about how you look necessarily. Are you beautiful? Are you TV worthy in that respect? It really isn't about that. It's how you behave and come across on camera. Are you compelling? Do you kind of look like what you're trying, the points that you're trying to drive home? Do you, are you sincere? Are people buying it? That's really what, what they're looking for on tape. I think we're all in agreement that once you've written your book, it's really too late. The time to start, as you say, is before. You have to know what you're going to face and allot those dollars, and Brian can certainly testify to that. He's been through that several times already. Yes, the, the timing is, is very important to set up the, the dates on which you'll make your tour and the dates on which you'll introduce your book. You have the major, the uh, BEA show, for example, might be a time you would introduce your book. Or if, if there is a, an anniversary coming up of some major news event and your book is about that, you certainly want to time your book to be published along with that. And then contact the, the publicists or the media months before that occurs because they have to set up their, their, they have to review your press kit, they have to review your book, they have to set up their itineraries, they have to choose their authors, and then they've got to, to set you up to come in. So, the more time you give everybody to make these events occur, the better off you are. And what you need to do is to line everything up with the bookstore, the radio station, the TV station, the local newspaper, if there's a weekly local magazine. So a book signing can work if it's part of a total promotional package, if it's part of done in conjunction with a radio interview that day or an interview on the local television station or an article in the local paper, a review that appeared last week. So if the signing is tied into all of those different kinds of things, it can work and be very effective and be a momentum continuer for the author and for that title. I've been on several tours. I've written a total of eight books. Uh, and the most important thing about being on tour is actually getting out there uh, and meeting the store managers, uh, talking to local media. And I think some people don't realize that, realize how important it is to meet the store managers. These are the people who are going to sell your books. Because knowing the producers, knowing what subject matter works on what shows is, is, is your key. And producers will trust you more than if, uh, if you give them what they need and what works for them. If I felt that there was something after a pre-interview, pre which is something that you'll experience if you're successful enough in contacting a producer and establishing interest, 
uh, they will interview you first over the phone. If I sensed that someone had animation, that someone really had passion and enthusiasm that would work, but really needed a little work around the edges, I would ask them to come in. I would work with them with clothing, hair, makeup, sitting, tips for how to really reinforce body language to what they were saying, and get a great program out of them if I felt that their topic was really something that we needed. And that's what happened. Publicists would call me from every major company and say, how did you do that? I didn't think our author was that prepared. And I said, I tried to send me a dud, huh? But often it really just takes a little fine tuning and tweaking. And from that, I developed kind of a formula for, for tips and, and instant kind of training that began to work for these people. And I, I reinforced it, developed it, started using videotape. And publicists were asking me if I would do that for them privately. But the truth of the matter is, because I took that spe special interest and did cultivate it and go to the next step, um, I'm able to really see it from both sides of the fence. But as a producer, all I was to care about was the show and how I was going to make that the best show and get ratings. My own gut instinct has always been to trust my telephone conversation with them, my pre-interview with them. So when I get that off there on the phone, I talk to the publicist, I talk to whoever, and I say, okay, I need to talk to the author. I am a talent executive now, but I haven't always been. I used to produce shows, and for me, when I did the pre-interview, that was the most important thing. That really gave me an understanding of what the person was about, how well they're going to speak on the air. I always thought it was a great thing when I had to interrupt my authors, because I would say, oh, they're talking, great, I have to interrupt them. And I would get off the phone and get very excited and go to whoever was there and say, oh, I just got a phone with so-and-so, great interview, this is going to be terrific. It's a very important part of this whole process, that pre-interview phone call, the, the, before you get on the show, they're, they're testing you to see what you can do. Well, they're testing to see how quickly you can think on your feet and field questions, which is so much a part of any talk show television. But I'd like Rick to talk more about the fact that you can get them to that point. You can get everybody to that point. But that pre-interview is a pretty much make or break situation for any and, author. Oh, yeah. And they are looking more than anything for energy. Uh, yes, we assume that you know your subject real well. But it's uh, the way in which you come across. And how well do you know my audience? How well can you relate to the people watching my show or listening to my show? So I need to know that uh, you can turn them on and you can make them stay tuned to my station and also do something. Right. Remember, you're there to make them buy your book and want to buy your book, but also so that they stay tuned to that show. And, and often we have quizzes and we have uh, um, contests and we want that audience to write in right into the show and that helps the producer often when they get a thousand letters coming to that station they go to their production uh, coordinator and their boss and say look at the great job that right. I did today so your job is always to help that producer and help them uh, make a good show because everybody's got a boss something that people don't usually think about but that can really help increase your chances of being booked on a television talk show is to have certain visuals that um, you can show people. For example, um, two of our clients that we worked with uh, had a book on relationships between men and women, what men and women usually argue about the most. And what we encourage them to do is to actually put together a bag um, of household objects that men and women fight over uh, the most. And we called this bag the gripe bag. And it had all uh, different things that people fight over like the car keys, the checkbook, um, the remote control. And what they did is they came on, uh, they, they said to producers, let us bring our gripe bag on the air and tell your um, viewers what we found in our research for our book, men and women fight uh, about the most. And as a result, they were booked on Good Morning America. And the confidence factor that a producer will have that you really mean that and you are sincere is that, as we said before, you've watched their show dozens of times. You know the dynamic between the audience and the, and the host. You understand what it is that makes their talk show different, why they're different from Phil or Oprah or Sally Jesse or whatever. You get it, you know it, and you know what your job is and what you're there to do. And that's a confidence builder. They know you really know their show. And they don't forget. Half the people that we've had booked on a Sally show or an Oprah show are there because first they were on a local show and then the... They really connected with that producer, and the producer remembered them, and then the producer went to Oprah and said, God, you know what? I had this incredible guest 
on AM Detroit or uh, Twin Cities Live. You know, when I was a, a producer in Minneapolis, we got to get that guy in the air here. Let's bring him in. So uh, people uh, know when you really care about them and when you want to do it for them, not just sell your book. And important to know for every author that that producer is your link to the host and you are your link to them. I mean, they really have a very tough job. They can't deliver anything to a host that's going to be unpalatable for that host or something that they're really not going to go for. They've got to know what's in a host's mind and how they think and is this going to jive with their kind of persona and you've got to know how you can help them get through to that and give them a way to go. That's the real important thing. From the producer's standpoint, if I'm looking for a good idea, I don't care where that good idea comes from. All I want is a great idea so that I can get my show on next week and do a fun, you know, do a fun show, an interesting show, a compelling show. And one tip we wanted to give you today too is when you're doing these interviews, try to give examples and try to give examples that your audience will relate to. And in fact, we do it a three-part system. Do uh, think of a problem think of an example of that problem that everyone in the audience will relate to today and then give them a solution. And then a kicker is, this is one of hundreds of solutions and ideas and things that we talk about in the book. So I can only give you one or two right now, uh, but you got to go get, you know, there's lots more where that came from. So you got to give them a little bit of a teaser that there's more, so they have to go get your book, but give them some concrete examples today that are really going to change their life. I agree. I often have authors come in and ask me, um, or their perception is that they have to synthesize somehow all the information in their book and give it to a, a, a host in a half an hour, and that isn't, that isn't necessary. It's teasers. It's things, tips, tips, tips. If you look at the cover of a magazine, I always say, that's a real good indicator of what you're going to see on a talk show in the given future. You know, whatever's on the side of uh, Red Book or Mademoiselle or any of these magazines are frequently excerpted book material that later hosts are going to see what the hot topics are and producers are going to look to to build a segment around. So that's another thing that you can do and practice again with your video camera talking about how they relate to your topic. The interviewer is looking for our three big points. Understand that before you go in. The interviewer may say that to you. So what are the big issues here? And you can say to them, A, B, and C. Now you've begun to manage your interview. You've steered them into an area without making them feel foolish, without dictating terms, per se, because they want to bring out the best in you. When you do a speech, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them it, and then you tell them, tell them what you told them. So you do it three <laughs> times. But get them ready and say, you know what, I'm t in, in one minute, I'm going to tell you a hint which is going to change your life or is going to make your son get a, go from an A from a C. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get that piece of paper out and pencil, and I want you to write it down. I know if you're in the car, it's going to be tough, but write it on your newspaper because an 800 number is coming up, and, and, uh, and this is going to change your life. So you got to get them ready to, to get the right information and kind of get their ears perked up. Make your subject topical. Not everything is new information. There's recycled information that comes at us from every direction all day long. The question is, how can you take your information and update it, even on the spot? How can you take it and make it relevant to today's person, to today's audience, to today's marketplace? And everything old then becomes new again. The other... Um tact that an author can take to put him or herself um, ahead of the pack is to relate your book to a current event. Um, there may have been a story that um, gained nationwide attention. Um, maybe there was a bad drunk driving crash um, where there were unfortunately lots of fatalities. If you're talking about alcoholism, maybe good to bring that story in and it would be great if the author had done his or her homework and said, well, recently there was a crash like this in Brooklyn or in Philadelphia or in Miami, wherever you're doing the interview, it'd be great to relate your book to a current story. Media training is one way of learning and there are many tips and we won't go into them now, but if you read your book, you'll, you'll, the workbook, you'll, you'll find many of them there. It's okay to disagree. There are ways to make your, you need to make your host look good. It's very important to do that, but you don't want to pander and become insincere 
or find yourself just nodding and being a talking head that, that really is just reinforcing what your host is saying. You're there to take control and you can always do it in a way that's appropriate, acceptable, uh, and, and really makes the host feel uh, like they're really connected to you and giving you eye contact. Eye contact is probably the single most important thing. That you can forget about the camera. Look into the eyes of your interviewer. Make a connection. And let them believe in you and that you're having a real exchange. The audience will get it. Good TV has a give and a take. And if you've got a different opinion, share it. That may set you apart. You have in your mind, look, here's what I'm on the show to talk about, and they just asked me this other question. So let me answer the question and then say, but I think what's important for us to understand about this topic is A, B, and C. Don't ever say, boy, that was a dumb question. No one has ever asked me that question. I can't believe that you asked that question. <laughs> didn't you read my book? Well, no, they didn't read your book. And then, uh, even if it's a stupid question, Get back to the right answer and segue and, and make that host feel good so that at the end of the, the show, A, they want you back, and B, they tell all their friends, and believe me, they talk, what a great guest you were. Well, you know, Katie Kirk probably gets up at about 3.30 in the morning to do that show, and you can say, as an author, when you're right there in front of a host like that, I know you're busy, everybody out there is busy. If you get nothing else from my book and you come away with just these three things, here's what I hope you learn and what will help you. That's enough to make people sail off the couch. You want to get them up off the couch mm. to go out there to get your book. Producers ultimately are looking for a good segment. If you have media training or if you think that you know what you're talking about and the segment isn't going your way, take a chance and get it back to where you need to get it to because the bottom line is if you walk off camera and it's not exactly the way they wanted it but it's still good, it's still good. Do your research. If you can find out that that host is a runner or loves cooking, or has uh, twins, uh, something specific about that person. When you get on the air that day and you say, gee, you know, I understand that you're a marathoner, or uh, I, I understand that you make your own spaghetti sauce, that host is going to say, wow, this guy really did his homework, and you're going to have a connection. And connection. what will happen is, instead of getting a five minutes on the air, you'll probably get longer. And uh, because that host is going to say, this guy cared about me to find out about my history and about what makes Absolutely me think. Right. And, and, and they're not going to forget. That also carries over as you first approach the studio. Because when you walk in, the guest before you might have canceled out or, or the, the guest who was supposed to come after you might have canceled out. And they may be evaluating you to see how much time they'll put you on the air. If, they, if you do a good job with the handshake, with the, the, the personality that you bring to the studio as you walk in, you, m you might be more, much more likely to get that extra time on the air, too. And what often happens is other producers and other people at the station are watching you Absolutely. on the air and may say, you know, that author was great. Let's hold them over and let's get them to, uh, on another show that we got going. And, and often you'll pick up additional interviews so that when you go to a town, instead of get, having four interviews that day, you now have turned it into a seven or eight or ten interview day. I think it's really important, and both of you have, have, have said it, but don't ever assume. You can't assume or presume anything. Go there hoping for the best and giving it your best shot and suspend all belief about what's possible because more may be possible than you realize. And as long as you are performing and performing well and connecting, connecting, connecting with every person that you meet with along the way. Understand to too that everything isn't going to go your way. There are times that you're going to be out on tour uh, when you're doing interviews that you, you get there, you traveled all night to get there, and then you're canceling at the last minute. It happens, and uh, if that's the case, don't flip out. Because if you make a big scene and you become a real difficult author, they don't forget that either. Remember that uh, people remember. Uh, every time you're on the air, first of all, when you walk in a studio, you're on from the moment you get there. Even Not when you're on the air, from the moment you walk in, Very because true. they are sizing you up. Secondly, when you're done, always send a thank you note. And that's one of the most important things you can do. We just had uh, Harvey McKay on tour, and he sold about five million books. And his first book was, uh, was the shark book. Um, and we just had him on CNBC, and the host of CNBC last week said, Harvey, I remember that you sent me a note, and this was from 1985. 
1997, he remembered that Harvey McKay said, you were one of the few authors that sent me a thank you note, and it really made a difference. And then what did we do? Harvey, on that day, called his office and had a very specific thank you note sent to that, uh, to that um, host, Federal Express, so it would be there that next day. So always send thank you notes. Um, I've even sent flowers if it's a really important show. Uh, let that person, uh, the producer know, and the host know that, that you appreciate it. Hey, we've talked a lot about television and all these hints of, that you can use on television. And think about your verbal, your vocal, and your visual skills. But all these also apply to radio. But the verbal and vocal skills carry more because you have to create that visual image on the radio. So there are additional hints that apply. And we'll, we'll talk about those now. Rick? Radio is the greatest medium in America today. Uh, most books in America are sold primarily in radio because it's, uh, it's very effective uh, and you out there I'm sure are on a budget and if you are radio is a way that you can reach millions and millions of people without ever having to leave your home. And it's actually a lot of fun and you don't have to get on a plane to do these interviews you can do them all. I did a hundred interviews from from my home. We do something called a morning drive radio tour uh, publishers across America and other PR firms set authors up on radio talk shows uh, all across America, and they're, lo they're all different types. I mean, think about TV. You have three or four stations in a market. How many do you have? How many radio stations do you have in a market? Fifteen or twenty, and you have lots of different kinds of formats that you can go right after. Um, years ago, we only had talk radio. The WABCs and the KGO in San Francisco and WBZ in Boston, which is talk radio with listener phone-ins. Uh, that's changed a lot uh, due to, to syndication, like Don Imus now is on all across America, and um, our friend Howard Stern. There are a lot of benefits, I think, for people who wish to be on a program such as this, a talk show, uh, mainly that you are getting a very involved audience. So whether you have a charity or some other cause that you're pushing or you're uh, selling maybe a book, maybe you're an author on tour, what have you. But you are getting an audience that is not treating you like verbal music. It's an audience that is involved, it's listening, uh, particularly on a program like this, a call-in show. People will offer their questions and their comments. So the first and foremost benefit is that you get people's attention. Every program has its own hierarchy. Uh, mostly, though, uh, radio talk programs have a host and a producer and an engineer. And it's uh, not very complicated. The producer gets the material, the producer re reviews the material in an, some kind of regular meeting with the host. They decide, thumbs up, thumbs down. There's lots of morning shows all across the country that will take you on for a shorter segment. But 10 minutes of, uh, of local radio uh, in a very powerful station, when you're reaching people in their car, is very powerful. They'll hear your message. Um, they'll listen to what you have to say, and they'll even write down your 800 number. And what's great about radio is you can get that 800 number out almost all the time. On TV, there's no guarantee that they'll give you your 800 number. And specifically, on national TV, they almost never will let you give an 800 number. Uh, so radio is, uh, is the most effective way of selling books in America, and uh, we know this for a fact. Random House, Simon & Schuster, Harper Collins, every major publisher uses it and sees enormous bumps in sales. Uh, we've seen bumps of 20%, even 50% after we do uh, uh, morning drives and, and other radio promotions. So uh, it's something that you have to have in your back of your mind. Uh, if you can afford an author tour, great. If you can afford a satellite TV tour, even better. Uh, if you can get out there and get on national TV shows, that's uh, the pinnacle, that's wonderful, but you've got to start somewhere, and radio is the place where everyone uh, can get their voice heard and sell a lot of books. The two what? major concepts of reach and frequency. If you, can, you can reach a lot of people on television, and they'll hear your message one time, but if you can contact the same audience more frequently using radio stations and radio programs, you're much more likely to make them remember what you're saying and go out and buy your book. Once the, the interviewer sits you down, 
you don't want to be stiff, but you don't want to be moving around and talking like this, or then you're on this side of the microphone. It's not going to work. Your voice is going to be all over the place. Your levels are going to be all over the place. So just try to remember that. Just try to stay in one spot. You have to remember that when you're doing a half an hour interview, sometimes you forget things. You want to mention certain things. So it's great if you've got them all marked right in front of you. In other words, I can't sit here and let dead air go on. So what will happen then is as the author is looking, and I can't find what was that quote that I wanted to use or where's that page number, I have to try to make up for that time. So what happens usually is that you wind up going on to a different topic. Hand signals are important um, when you get the feeling that you're running out of time. Sometimes I get one of these. I give the, inter the author one of these or we're running out of time. Or I will actually say um, to the author, we have about two minutes left. Can you give me your answer in about two minutes? I'd like to talk to both of you a little bit about now to describe a little bit of how technology has changed the way we have opportunities to reach our audiences now. You mentioned satellite tours. Um, maybe we could go into that a little bit for the, for the authors out there. Uh, the vehicles that we're going to be talking about today are satellite media tours and radio media tours, which simply put are series of prearranged one-on-one -on -one interviews, either with television stations or radio stations around the country or around the world, on a given topic that is agreed to in advance with a talent, one, two, or three people even, um, who will be speaking and answering questions live or live on tape from a reporter either at the television station or the radio station. I think the way to look at a satellite media tour is to conceive of a person in one location with X amount of time, two hours, three hours, whatever, speaking pretty much the same message in response to questions from reporters around the country. The whole world has changed. I mean, I came into this business in 1976. And uh, when I started, we had an old clunker IBM typewriter that we pit that we uh, sent our, um, our our pitch letters out on. And uh, all there was was an author tour, and you had to send someone across the country. Now um, we do uh, teleprint conferences with use of a, a very sophisticated conference services where we have 15, 20 editors on the line. Uh, we uplink authors from anywhere in the world where they can be on 20 to 30 TV stations all in a two and a half hour period. Uh, and this is just like you see on Larry King, just like you see on Nightline. Um, and what's nice with, is with technology, we can bring a truck into anywhere in the country and, uh, and have an author up uh, on a satellite and uh, across the world. Uh, radio, uh, satellite we utilize a lot, but now um, it is it done primarily with just very good, clear phone lines. So we have authors, uh, and very famous ones at that, from uh, do, doing shows uh, in their bathrobes from their home. And we've had them do it even uh, from a beach in, in the Bahamas. Uh, so technology has changed everything. And it's really helped you because you don't have to go to 30, 40 cities anymore. You can do a few cities and then do the rest right from your home and we can come to you. Now the media training is a critical part of all this. And Susie, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, when the author should start media training? Well, I think just like we talked to Rick about planning and, and, and preparing for publicity, uh, as soon as you put your fundamentals in place and your game plan in place, it's never too early to begin. You're always going to be concerned about uh, a print interview or any kind of interview at all. You're going to need this media training and it's going to come in handy. Uh, most people say, how do I know if I need it? Well. I say trust the professionals that you're working with. If you do have a publicist, ask them what he thinks. If you're working with a book publisher, ask them, someone that's likely to be taking you through step by step. And if they say to you, you know, I think you could really benefit from this, or it might just help smooth things out, trust their judgment. How long does it take to take media training? I think everyone is different. My typical strategy is to spend about 10 hours with somebody because I find that everyone has a different attention span. And it's very difficult to know precisely how quickly someone is going to be able to integrate new information into their personality and behavior and, and give it back. So 
the first session that I typically do uh, is always on camera. I always do things on camera so that the uh, author can take something away with them to practice with. Well, if the author wrote the book, isn't it really all that you need to know? Just talk about what's in your book? Well, talking about what's in your book is important, but somebody needs to help you synthesize that information. If you've got a 300-page book, it's impossible to talk in three minutes or five minutes or even seven minutes if you have a, a long interview on a show about everything in your book. So someone needs to help you boil down and synthesize the main points of your book and the issues that are really critical to helping someone help themselves. And if you boil your book down to those three subjects and then again three topics within those subjects, the issue in media training is that people remember things in threes. There's a lot of psychological observations that uh, I get to fill authors in on and let people know that are true about most every one of us and how people receive information. And that's something most people have never paid any attention to or really had any reason to consider. We teach people that things clustered in threes are they're likely to remember. I'd like to make three points about the book. When you're doing that and you're counting off on your, every time you make contact with your finger, your audience is making contact with your point contact. You want to contact your audience, you want to make contact with your point, and reinforce what it is you're trying to say, point by point. Authors or people in general communicate the bulk of their message uh, visually. How mm -hmm. can we be better at communicating visually, using body language, for example? One of the tools uh, that I use, again, is video. Uh, a lot of times we think that we are reinforcing what we're saying or what's in our mind by the way our facial expressions or the way that we're moving or using our hands to demonstrate a point. It's very frequently not the case. Sometimes preoccupation plays a role and it reads on your face without you even realizing it. It's impossible to be aware of how you look and how well you're, you're emphasizing what it is you're saying unless you see yourself while you're talking. The eyes are the, the mirrors of the soul as they say. How can we use eye contact to uh, further our interviews? Well, I think it's a sign of respect. When you, when you sit with an interviewer and somebody's asking you a direct question and you look into their eyes, you're giving them your undivided attention. That's very, very important. It's a very valuable thing. It's a sign of respect. It means that you care about them and what they want to know and what they have to say. It's not always just about us. And you'll also know in someone's eyes whether you're getting long-winded, whether you're, whether you're making your point, whether you're confusing them. And so it's very important because if you make eye contact, you're going to get those messages very quickly and you'll know how to veer and steer your track a little more on center as a result. If there's more than one person interviewing, it will be clear when the ball is being passed to the other person. And the simplest thing to do is make eye contact with the person who's going to be asking the next question. And then you get on with your agenda, your answers, or whatever the case may be. A great facial expression is a simple smile. How important is smiling to the interview? Well, smiling naturally, I think, is very important. The thing, the thing that is more important is not to check anything. If you want to smile, smile. If you feel yourself going to a smile or a surprised look, let it go. The important thing is to be natural, be in the moment, and naturally respond to whatever's going on. I think if you're going to paste a smile on your face and think that that looks great and stick with that, uh, throughout an entire interview when some serious topics are being discussed, you're going to look ridiculous. But when it's appropriate to smile, do, at least to the extent that it looks like you're having a great time. And if you're really having a great time, you don't have to remember to smile. You'll be smiling. If the host is smiling, you'll be smiling. You get someone's attention by speaking clearly, by being confident. When you bring a presence to the screen because you're confident, not cocky, confident. You fill the screen and your voice carries a ring to it. You want people who are animated. That does not mean over the top. You want someone that has a loud voice but not someone who's screaming. You want someone who's articulate but who is not pompous. You're talking about someone who can speak clearly about a subject, who gets their point across in less words, not more, and someone who can adapt themselves to their environment. Let's talk about clothes. What makes people look really good on television? Well, I always tell people things that move with you. It's very important. When, you, when you're on television, you want to have to not be concerned about anything but what you're thinking, saying, doing, and being in the moment. So things that move with you and that don't make you uncomfortable, fidget in your seat, are the things you want to wear. I often find for women that knits 
are the best thing because they don't gap, they don't pucker, it's not a structured jacket that kind of stays in one place while you're moving somewhere else. For men, I often suggest, since men have to wear a structured suit jacket as a rule, that they consider wearing a less formal uh, uh, shirt uh, instead of a shirt and tie. They can wear some of these sweaters that have knitted collars and three buttons. It's very fashionably these days. If you do have to wear a shirt and tie and you feel like you're a little punchy in the midsection and you don't feel comfortable, wear a sweater vest, a sleeveless vest, so that your, your jacket can stay open and you still look put together and you still look like things can just kind of go on around you and you don't have to worry about tugging at your jacket or keeping your jacket buttoned or closed. So those are things that are very helpful. Things that move with you. Anything that drapes or falls, I'd stay away for things that are too short for women. And uh, anything, as I said again, anything that's too loud, whether it's a color, too overstated, uh, anything decoratively that's too severe, are all things that are going to just take away from what it is you're there to do and say. These chairs, as soon as you sit down, feel what you're on. This one sinks back. Yes. So that's not a great place to be. Now you're going to have your knees coming up at you. So I would suggest that you move up a little bit. Put your feet flat on the floor. Get yourself comfortable. Make sure your jacket's laying smoothly. For men, the odds are you're going to be unbuttoning your jacket. For women, you may unbutton the bottom just so that it lays nice and smooth. No one's going to know button open, button not. You want it to lay smooth. Check your pockets. Make sure you don't have glasses sticking out of them. Make sure you don't have pens showing. Because then what happens is the viewer sees that and they're not looking at you. Here are some tips to help you when you're practicing at home. First thing you need to remember is that television is a two-dimensional box. It's square, just like this, and you're inside it. You have to remember the parameters of what you're working with because if your gestures are lost off camera and something's in on a tight shot on you and your gestures are over here, you're missing your point and so is everyone else. So I'm going to show you some things that might help. First of all, you're usually going to be sitting in a chair and be placed in a chair before the show begins. Always remember to sit at the edge of your seat. Sitting at the edge of your seat already conjures up, wow, I'm on the edge of my seat, something's exciting, something's about to happen, I might wanna, not want to miss. So that's a very good thing to do. Here's what happens when you lean back and get too comfortable. It isn't attractive. You also don't look engaged in what's going on on the show. So remember, sit on the edge of your seat, and if you focus on my feet for just a moment, with one foot in front of the other on the floor, you can be in some sort of a rocking motion which makes you ready for anything. If you're at the edge of your, of your seat, you can lean forward into your interviewer to make a point. You can also stand very easily and very gracefully and sit down again without having to be disruptive. I always tell people that if they're really, really comfortable in their chair, they're not sitting correctly. Remember to be on the edge of your seat. Remember the confines of the arms of your chair. Reach out to your audience and the people at home. Reach out to your host. Don't be afraid to lean for forward. This position helps you be animated and ready for anything. Good luck. Practice what I'm telling you, and I think you'll be a great guest. You've written a book. You've done all the research. You've bought these videotapes and the book uh, that, that goes along with this. The one thing you have to remember is this is a great time in your life. Sit back for a moment and have fun. Enjoy it. Because not many people in the world can say, I've written a book. This is forever. You will always be the author of this book. And no one can take it away from you. So sit back and enjoy. Well, we've come to the end of our program. And I'd like to ask my, my partners here to help me wrap up some of the things that we've really tried to bring to your attention today. And one of the things uh, we talked about was after you finally had your successful appearance on television or radio, one of the things you want to do is get a tape and make sure you ask a producer for the tape of your show. Every, don't miss any opportunities to review all your performances. One of the tips in getting a tape, by the way, is when you go out there, bring a VHS tape with you and give it to the producer and very nicely ask them if they could give you a tape. Uh, also bring an audio tape with you. Nine out of ten times, if you're a good guest and you do it in the right way, they'll give you a tape for free. Worst case scenario is you can always uh, offer to pay them a few dollars to make a tape for you. And then there are, there are lots of monitoring services like video monitoring service uh, that you can call uh, to get a tape. It could cost 80 to to $100, but get every tape you can because you're going to use it later on. Uh, and even with this book, after you've sold your 100,000 copies, um, you're going to want to 
to sell it to Simon Schuster, Harper Collins, and they're going to give you lots of money for it. So you're going to want copies of those tapes to show how good you were. The way I boil it down is to, in a uh, one word that being on television and radio is as easy as pie if you plan, implement, and evaluate. Do the preparation, do the show, but that evaluation is a critical part of it. Take the tapes from your show, your radio and television, and, and review those. Practice, go over those. Find out where you might have uh, answered a question a little bit differently. What questions really uh, gave you a hard time? How can you go back and practice a different answer to those? But always evaluate and try to do better and plan, implement, and evaluate. It's as easy as pie. And understand you're never there. You're never done learning. You're never done practicing. And I know you know that, Rick. Well, remember, this is a process. and. Uh, when you think you have it, think about Tiger Woods. He's the best golfer in the world. And after he won the Masters, uh, he started another golf tournament. And uh, he realized he wasn't just quite perfect. And he flew in his, uh, his pro from Houston and said, I got to get it better. I got to get it better. And that's why he's getting all these endorsements, because he, nothing is ever good enough. You have to always be striving to be better than you were yesterday. And we're here to help you. Uh, we hope this videotape has helped you in the workbooks, and we'd like you to go over it over and over again. And then if you have any questions, you know, there's numbers in the back of the, of the book and the tape. And uh, remember that uh, there's always tomorrow, and you can always be better. You don't have to review the entire tape. Every time, pick out the parts that are most important to you in your particular stage of your tour. And then review those sections and go back over with those which you, you need more help. So it, it's always there. It's your constant media trainer there whenever you need it. Thanks for watching. We wish you good luck in getting on the air.